Well, it's day 12 of self-isolation and I, I'm, fe I'm feeling pretty good. I feel like I've got a lot done with my spare time, like like cooking. I, I made a quiche in the week that I was very proud of. It was very tasty. And so far at least, you know, productivity hasn't diminished. Although I seem to be scraping the bottom of the barrel for ideas, which is why I've come up with worst water levels. I'm rationing the good ideas for a, a better time, I promise you. Not that discussing bad water levels isn't a great idea or anything, it's just a little run of the mill. I guess it's just a bit of a tired cliche to complain about water levels since we've got decades of history as proof that video games have, time and time again, struggled to get the most out of this unique setting for a stage. There's so much material to wade through that it makes you wonder why games adhere to this trope when the chances are that it'll be a massive low point in the game. How much would you put on the line for a little bit of variety? Water levels aren't automatically bad by default, but the designing of one has to be done with a lot of care and consideration for what this change of pace does to the overall adventure. There are some wonderful water levels out there that take advantage of a unique feature or two that comes with the territory, but they just serve to highlight how lazily some other levels are put together. You can't just drown a regular level and expect it to work just as well as a normal level where you're not being slowed down by the massive amount of molasses-like water that's slowly crushing your spirit into a tiny, extremely saturated ball of disappointment. Video games can be so many different things. Why would you choose to make them bad? You can equate water levels to being somewhat similar to stealth sections. They're actually nothing alike, but when mistreated and haphazardly thrown into a game that isn't built for them, both types of levels stick out as just a really bad idea in general. Just like you shouldn't try to integrate stealth into a game that isn't designed with stealth in mind, you really should think twice about putting in a water level if your game doesn't have a fun way of moving underwater. This is most of the reason why I enjoy Majora's Mask Great Bay Temple, because despite a confusing layout and method of navigating the dungeon, you've got Zora Link swimming so smoothly through every room that navigation itself is enough fun to keep me going through some of the trickier parts. It's not Zelda, so we probably shouldn't hold it to the same high standards, but Conker's Bad Fur Day is a game made by Rare and came out just one year after Majora's Mask. And the water level in this game makes me long for the sweet release of death. By its nature, Conquer's Bad Fur Day never spends too long on one particular idea. You can't parody a ton of different ideas and films and stay the same kind of game the whole time. And to Conquer's credit, it shows at least a small nugget of restraint before going balls to the wall crazy with a zombie section and a military shooter section and a ton of other stuff that doesn't fit the 3D platformer aesthetic that it was using from the start. In a big dose of irony, swimming around in this vault feels surprisingly symptomatic of this type of game and doesn't feel like too great of a departure, but I still hate it a lot. For one, the vault you're swimming around in is so dimly lit that you need a head torch to see where you're going, which also needs topping up just like your supply of air, so that's another thing for you to worry about. The camera is not your friend here, since it'll hang behind Conquer in such a way that obscures the enemies in the area. Or they'll hide themselves around corners so you have no time to react to them being there, that's always entertaining. This whole area is so cramped that it becomes such a maze to navigate, which will mean that you'll likely spend too long in here and watch Conquer's little face contort as he runs out of oxygen. It's not even a major section of the game either, it leads on to something else, but no significant story beats happen inside this watery vault, which makes me think that all of this could have been done a little bit differently. But I suppose Rare needed to fill their quota of water sections. Microsoft overpaid for you. The tiniest saving grace is that this irritating level is not the first underwater section in the game, so at least you've got a bit of time to practice and get used to the controls that are mostly terrible, but not a shade on anything else in this vault. The enemies that appear around corners and, you know, I don't even know what the fuck they are, but you always hit them. I think I'd rather drown. The typically bad water level has more than a few things wrong with it. We'll be getting into the nitty gritty of that as we go along, but technically a bad water level is any terrible level that is associated with water in some way. The trope exists because a lot of water levels alter the physics and speed of movement in the game, so simple navigation becomes a challenge that often feels unnecessary rather than any shade of satisfying. 
With all that said though, do you reckon I can get away with a level that has other problems that aren't wholly related to janky physics? I mean, Atlantica from the first Kingdom Hearts game has some fucked up swimming controls, but that's the case with every other 3D action adventure RPG Disney game. You'd have to have something else ticking away in the background or looming over the whole area with a threatening aura. It's a terrifying place under the sea. Darling, it is definitely not better down where it's wetter because what the fuck is this level doing in this video game? I know Kingdom Hearts is a bit silly sometimes and has a history of strange, tonally confusing scenarios that raise more questions than answers, but I struggle immensely with Atlantica from the first game. Underwater combat is something that you're just gonna have to get used to, but at no point does it all click and it feels like this change up in gameplay is to any kind of benefit whatsoever. That's okay though, because compared to the sequel, this Atlantica is a priceless piece of art because, for some strange fucking reason, Kingdom Hearts 2's Atlantica is roughly an hour of quick time events that outline the plot of The Little Mermaid. No combat, no exploration, just a bunch of sitting around watching cutscenes and occasionally pressing some buttons to make things happen on screen. Personally, I'm torn because I hate the feel and flow of Kingdom Hearts 1's Atlantica, but the sequel doesn't even try to be anything. It's like Asura's Wrath, but instead of larger than life boss fights and an anime aesthetic that goes massively over the top of everything, it's just in-game scenes from The Little Mermaid, which is a great film by the way, but at this moment in time, I'd rather be playing this game than watching it. Must be bad if I'm actively wishing that I was sploshing around in that water. I am not okay with that. Oh boy, I sure do love me some Crash Bandicoot sometimes. Only sometimes, because these games are operating off decades old game design that often comes unstuck when it comes to important things like hit detection and pin precision platforming that makes me want to go play something that's easier on the blood pressure. Like Dark Souls. That'll be more fun. Even with the recent remakes, Crash Bandicoot is often a victim of some shaky ideas and even shakier implementation of those ideas. And I can't help but come back to Coral Canyon from Wrath of Cortex as a prime painful example of what happens when you add variety to your game that naturally ramps up to one final example of this type of level that is just drenched in stupid bullshit. The underwater levels in Wrath of Cortex are tolerable to a point since just when the controls start to grate on you, the level ends shortly afterwards and you can go back to dying through more conventional means. It's like a short interlude that helps you to appreciate the rest of the game's design because uh, it is hard to do that on your own. I'll take any help I can get at this stage. Crash Bandicoot is no stranger to changes in level style or perspective or camera angles because this kind of variety is what helped to set it apart from competitors back in the day. Sadly, this also means that water levels were always an inevitable part of the package that you just have to struggle through and, and tolerate. Especially since they have a lot of the same issues that the regular levels do, except now you're underwater and everything's really, really fucking floaty. How kind of you. This is like the perfect storm of aggravating level construction, and I for one am definitely not on board with any of it. Coral Canyon is the 19th level out of 30 in Wrath of Cortex, and it's safe to say that at this point, you're likely fairly adept at the standard flow of Crash Bandicoot platforming and at judging jump arcs and other important shit like platform speed, I guess. So it's a shame then that the water levels in this game don't require any of those skills as you'll run through a two-dimensional side-scrolling section full of mines and exactly too much water so that you have to swim through it. I don't need this right now, and I especially don't need Coral Canyon where you start in a submarine with a giant hitbox and have to weave your way through reminders that if you've enjoyed this video and want to see more, then feel free to subscribe for more and click the bell for notifications of every new upload. This is one of the hardest levels in the game, but it's difficult because of the floaty physics and the obtuse design decisions, and because it's asking you to do something that you're not as well practiced with as the rest of the game. I hate the fact that the hardest level in Wrath of Cortex is a water level that feels so cheap and unnecessary, but I am really glad that it's to be found in a game that hasn't been remastered yet. That way I can tuck it away in a distant corner of gaming history and pretend it doesn't exist. Don't let me down, naughty dog.
Developers have been falling over water levels for decades now. I suppose no one's told them that, in general, water levels are just a waste of time and resources, and that you should probably be looking for other, more organic ideas for natural game variety. But in the 80s and 90s, it was a pure time where no one had quite worked out that water levels in general are bad news. Although with so many examples since that time, they should have worked it out a hell of a lot sooner. Ah, to be a games developer in the 80s. As long as you had enough restraint to stay away from certain chapters of the American Civil War, you could do no wrong as you stumbled from one creative idea to the next in the vague hope that at least one would stick with audiences and you'd suddenly be well on your way to creating a brand new franchise of games to come. I'm not saying that this is part of the influence behind some of the water-based levels and games from this period of time that are lethargic and slightly less fun than taxes, but I can forgive some of this since developers were still finding their feet as a whole. You can understand and move on from that one level in the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game on the NES where there's all this water and seaweed and a timer because those devs didn't know what they were doing. Or they did, and they're a bunch of evil geniuses. Sometimes it's better to assume ignorance before malevolence. Though this game was developed by a pre-Pachinko obsessed Konami, and I can't imagine that there was ever any malicious intent behind TMNT's famously brutal difficulty. There's an argument to be made in favour of harsh difficulty adding hours of playtime to basic NES games so that you get a lot of value for money, but I feel like this game goes too far in lots of places. It's actually one of the hardest games ever made, and while I don't think anyone from this time period was deliberately trying to achieve this, TMT comes pretty damn close. A lot of the difficulty comes from a lot of unfinished game design that sucks the fun out of most situations, but none more so than the game's swimming level that I don't really need to introduce or explain because most of you already know what I'm talking about. The damn level is surprisingly short given its notoriety, but it makes up for it by filling three minutes with electrified seaweed and painful barriers that you need to navigate with very imprecise controls that just aren't fit for purpose in order to defuse eight bombs within the time limit. Anything else you need to do in there? Maybe solve world hunger while I'm there and find a f cure for cancer while doing battle with deadly seaweed and the inevitability of time itself? There is a reason why people remember this level above all others from TMNT and it's probably because they spent so much time on it in order to beat it when they were younger, if they even beat it at all. You can't tell me this level got this crazy by accident. I can't overstate the significance of free-flowing movement in video games. You think back to the last game you played and you should be able to remember if it had some kind of special way of moving around like the rollerblades in Pokemon X and Y or rocket jumping in Team Fortress 2 or Titanfall 2's wall running or even Zora Link in Majora's Mask that allows for rapid underwater swimming. Put simply, if you need to move around a lot in a video game, it's helpful if that movement is fun and enjoyable and not slowed down to a crawl by an underwater level. Sonic games have been about free-flowing movement since the very beginning, and while I don't think flat-out speed is necessarily the order of the day here, flying through a level as smoothly as possible is unbelievably satisfying. Why you'd ever want to ruin this with a water level is beyond me, but I guess Sega are always trying new things. And that's great and all, but those new things are fucking stupid. Labyrinth Zone, conceptually, makes quite a lot of sense. If you're making the first Sonic game at the start of the 90s, you're probably gonna design levels that each carry a different theme, like Marble Zone being an underground lava level and Spring Yard Zone being a more urban stage with bumpers and springs, and Green Hill having lots of... green. By that logic, Labyrinth Zone is the perfect opportunity to introduce water and see how it changes the physics of a game that you should be used to by now. In practice though, Labyrinth Zone is a painfully slow slog through cryptic level design that funnels you into taking these moving platforms that I always fall off of and into the deep water below where Sonic sinks like a stone for some reason, and you wade your way from one bubble jet to the next in a desperate attempt to not hear the game lose its shit over Sonic's rapidly diminishing oxygen levels. I don't enjoy this, and I don't think many people would say that this is even remotely representative of what Sonic is and should be. Every time I replay Sonic 1, I get to Labyrinth Zone and miraculously find something else to do with my life. No amount of self-isolation is going to change that. This is Rebel Luigi, and believe it or not, there is a way to make Labyrinth Zone even worse, because the GBA port of Sonic 1 has the camera zoomed all the way in, 
and terrible optimizations, the, the frame rate chugs every time anything exciting is happening on screen, and it looks like crap. The resolution, not great. So, if you want a really bad time, the worst time you can have playing a Sonic game, play Labyrinth Zone on the Game Boy Advance. You'll wish it was Sonic 06 in no time at all. Have you got a topic that you'd like me to talk about next week? Make sure you leave a comment about that down below because I'll be taking the most interesting suggestions and making a poll on the next video. In fact, here's one right now that I prepared from last week. I'll be revealing the winner of the poll on Twitter and taking suggestions for games to talk about that are related to that topic. So feel free to follow me over there so we can keep in touch. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.